All right, you guys, welcome to Pro Trader Strategies Market Commentary for Road Trip to Trading Options. I'm Eric Wilkinson. Um, we are going to kind of do this course a little bit different than some of my past courses. So if you watch some of those, this is going to be structured a little bit differently. Ultimately, the rules are going to remain the same, but we're going to get to the end uh, a little bit differently through our roadmap coverage. Uh, but let me get a couple of things out of the way real quick. I'm Eric Wilkinson. You may very well recognize me as the Wolf Fan from mainstream media, where I've talked about everything from economic to geopolitical and how that impacts the markets with my market analysis. Um, I have daily market commentaries where I do that same thing in those. And then also in those daily market commentaries, I talk about actual trades that I'm putting on, when, where, and why I'm doing that. And following the guidelines that I'm kind of set forth here in these webinars. So one of the things with the daily market commentaries, I'm kind of assuming you've at least watched a few of the uh, webinars. So you're up to speed on some of the nuances that we will drill down on in these webinars. So uh, check out those daily market commentaries uh, because there's hopefully some good, useful information out of there. At least you'd be able to see how somebody who does this on a daily basis goes throughout the process to put these strategies on i don't cherry pick uh trades as a matter of fact i talk about my losers more than my probably my winners and uh that's because i'm talking about those losers in order to stay mechanical and flip the table over and turn that into a winning trade shady trees back in the house long time since he's, i've seen him uh, pop up uh, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, everybody. Also, uh, I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to probably call out everybody by name, but welcome to the webinar. Uh, so in that time, I've traded. I actually started out trading stocks in college and options a little bit, like doing covered calls, starting out like you with your basic options, moved to Chicago and started working on the floor of the board of trade, uh, trading everything from stocks, financial futures, commodity futures, currencies and options on all those products. Matter of fact, somebody brought up the fact not too long ago that uh, I actually helped design some option strategy uh, contract or option contract, I should say, at the Board of Trade. It was 30 day Fed fund options. So I was a part of that as well. So something I forgot to, you know, throw out there as a vanity metric, I guess. <laughs> All right. Anyway, you can follow me on Twitter at Wolfman's blog or or our parent company at Pro Trader Strat. Uh, for instance, you know, today talking about earnings, I do the webinar or the morning commentaries early uh, and then put on my earnings trades late in the afternoon. So I'll talk about in the daily market commentaries what my earnings trades probably going to be or what I'm leaning towards. Uh, but I implement those towards the end of the day. So I throw stuff out like that on Twitter that uh, you can kind of follow along. They are not recommendations to follow me. Uh, my directional assumption might be completely different than what yours is, and yours might even be better than mine. Who knows? All right, so Facebook, follow us there because that's where we're pumping out a lot of this content, whether it's a webinar, daily market commentary, all that stuff, uh, not even just by me, but by several other uh, speakers that we have to teach you on everything from trading options to how to uh, look at the charts and read the charts there. So. Uh, all kinds of good content that you can find over there at ProTraderStrategies.com. All right, so this is the poor man's covered put. And just like all of the other webinars in this course, what I want to do is start out with our assumption because nobody goes out there and says, I want to put on a poor man's covered call. I don't know why I put put there. Uh, this is going to be on the poor man's covered call. Um, but poor man's covered call. So clearly, mark this, strike this from your memory. We're doing the call anyway. Poor man's covered call. Uh, but I want you to still put this on the shelf, you guys. Why? Because I want to follow through our regiment, like what you or I would do on any given basis. We don't think about what strategy we want to put on and then find the underlying for that strategy. Usually it's because we've come up with an assumption around some underlying, whether it's from watching TV or doing your own market analysis, all of those things may combine even to come up with 
a directional assumption. Maybe you want to fade Kramer. I don't know. Uh, but you come up with that directional assumption based on your analysis. And then we look at the internals of what's going on around that underlying. That will lead us down the path to the right option strategy. So uh, let me get a couple of things out of the way. I know a few of you guys are returning and probably have seen some of this roadmap key, but if we're going on a road trip, we need to know how to read the map. This is kind of the map to being able to read the option montage on a uh, trading platform. So we need to know what this is before we start trading options because they're very important. They tell us all kinds of different things. And some of you guys' heads are just exploding. Oh my God, he's not starting this webinar out talking about uh, the Greeks. I, the last thing I want to do is try and learn Greeks. Uh, but it's really important. So I'll give you guys some really easy ways to understand how the Greeks work. Delta. Delta measures the uh, rate of change in the option premium for every $1 move. So as the underlying moves up by a dollar, our premiums are going to increase by that corresponding delta. So what we can do is go over here and look at the option montage. Let's just say this is X, Y, Z. It doesn't matter what it is, right? So what we're gonna do is this is the option montage, this page. If we look over here, we've got delta. Delta is in line here. The deeper in the money you go, which is this gray area, the further into the money you go, uh, the higher delta gets. Further out of the money you go, which is this way, uh, the less delta or the smaller delta is. But let's just look at the ones that are right here at the money, okay? So if this underline goes from 167.13 to 168.13, we're going to be looking at an increase of $1, right? The premiums over there are going to then increase by, like I said, that corresponding delta. So. What we have here is uh, 244 on the bid. It increases by two or by 45 cents for that one dollar increase. Now our bid is going to be looking at something like uh, 289, right? 289 on the bid. The offer increases by that same corresponding 45 uh, cents, and we're going to have uh, 298. All right. So for that one dollar increase, that would be how our underlines increase so we got a one dollar increase let's say uh to that 168 that's what's going to happen there all right vice versa if you look well let's just look at this delta on the positive side for the calls calls are positive you can see that the delta on the puts is negative if you have that one dollar increase well look over there at delta over on the puts. that's a negative delta so a dollar increase our premiums go down then by that 50 cents. So in this regard, uh, we would be looking at 241 for these uh, uh, 67 ones, so 241, and then they decrease by 50 cents here, and we're gonna be looking at 249, all right? So for that same dollar increase, the puts go down in value, calls go up in value. Now, if it was a negative $1 move, and now we're trading at 166.13, right? So we've gone down by a dollar. Well, all of these Greeks are assuming a positive move, all right? Whether it's a day goes by, volatility increases, all right? Um, all of those things are talking about basic assumptions of a positive move. Uh, so if you have a negative move, a negative dollar, to a positive delta, if you have a negative plus a positive, what does that do? It makes it negative, right? So in that regard, then our premiums, uh, if you had a negative dollar move, would have gone to uh, 199, right, on the bid. So that would have negatively affected if the underlying moved down. And on the other side, if this would have gone down by a dollar, a negative plus a positive makes this delta a positive to the trade. So they would have gone from 291 to now uh, $3.41, right? Because that negative delta becomes a positive to the premium. So they would have increased, all right? Um, then we look over there at the next one, which is gamma. The easiest way to remember gamma, what does it do? It goes with delta, all right? 
So we talked about Delta being the first dollar move higher. Well, Gamma goes with Delta on dollar number two. All right, so dollar number two. So that second dollar move is how Gamma starts then affecting uh, the premium. So now let's say we went from 168 to 169.13. So this is a $2 total move, right? We've gone up by $2. So that second dollar move, this gamma goes into the delta, adds into it. So when we talked about our premiums increasing by um, uh, 45 cents on that first dollar, the second dollar, we get 50 cents adding into that premium over there, right? So basically on these 168 calls, we're going basically from, uh, 290, uh, we got a 50 cent increase. So we're going from 289, a 50 cent increase puts us at $3 and 30, what is it? $3 and 39 cents, is that right? Uh, off the top of my head, $2 and 39 cents, or $3 and 39 cents. And that offer would be uh, $3 and 48 cents. Okay, so see how the gamma adds into delta on the next dollar move. So if this was a $1 move, this is a $2 moves, that's where we could expect our premiums to go, all right? And on the other side, if we look at it on that second dollar move higher, we've got a negative delta on, on here and a positive gamma. So that means on that second dollar move, it's only going to affect our premiums by 45 cents, all right? So those premiums are gonna go down by 45 cents. So in this case, we would then see our premiums being right around $2.04 here, and they go down by, what did I say, 45 cents? We're looking at basically uh, 197, no, 196, all right? So on that second dollar move higher, our premiums would decrease a little bit less. Flip side, obviously, it goes down by $2. That gamma then adds into the delta on the second dollar move because we got a negative dollar plus a positive delta plus a positive gamma, and that makes it add into it, all right? So it helps, helps you there. So gamma, gamma simply goes with delta. It's as simple as that. Same or gamma goes with delta on the second dollar move. All right, theta. Theta, just remember theta is our thief in the night. All right, theta, the, uh, theta the thief or the thief theta, however you want to say it. But basically, it's the impact on the premium also, right? We look at that theta component and how tomorrow our premiums are going to look if everything else remained the same. There hasn't been a, a penny move. There hasn't been an uptick in volatility at all. All we're seeing is that theta come and eat away at our premium. Now, uh, sometimes, I'll do an Alexander, sometimes that's a good thing if you're wanting that premium to go down. And if you are buying premium, you probably don't want that to go down so much. So a couple of things to think about here. If we want to lessen the impact of theta, how do we do that? Well, one, you can take advantage of it and you know invite the thief into your home. And what I mean by that is basically you would sell premium, be like, come take it, come take all my penny jars or whatever. But basically what theta is saying is it's always negative, right? Because it, you can't stop it, you can't go back in time. Nobody has that DeLorean. That, takes you back in time or the time uh, uh, hot tub. <laughs> so basically tomorrow, all else things being equal, we would see these premiums decrease by four cents. So we would be looking at something like uh, $2.40 and uh, $2.49 on the offer, all right? You can't ever stop theta from happening. It's, it's going to happen. Now, something to note that theta affects the closer duration contracts and even into the weeklies greater 
than the ones that are further out in time. So, you know, get those levers and pulleys going. If you want to take advantage of theta, you probably want to get closer to expiration or use a shorter duration, right? And if you want to limit that theta decay by almost half as much sometimes, depending uh, on your days to expiration, but you go out in time, you know, outside of like 70 days, you will really dramatically decrease that theta component coming at you. So if you're thinking about buying options premiums, you kind of want to lean a little bit towards those longer duration contracts than the nearer duration. Um, you know, I know a lot of people out there will talk about trading the weeklies um, and buying options in those, those weeklies, but I think I'll show you uh, here throughout this webinar why that's not a good idea because you literally have to have an immediate move in that underlying according to your directional assumption in order to off, just offset that theta component. So we wanna get ourselves in a situation where we're setting ourselves up for success. Uh, and the only way to do that is that inception of the building of this type of strategy in any option, all right? So you wanna set yourself up for success. The only way to really do that is uh, right here and right now, when you come up with your assumption, you start drilling down on these different components. All right, so obviously tomorrow, no matter what happens, losing four cents out of the puts as well. All right, Vega, the last Greek. And believe it or not, Vega is not even a Greek. This, this, uh, this right here is stolen. It's, it, it's the lowercase gamma. I don't want to confuse you or anything there, but I also... Uh, for anybody who is Greek savvy knows that that's not a Greek and um, we are kind of fudging here with that little Greek symbol. I think they um, they came up with Vega just because it probably looks like volatility. Um, but I stole that Greek symbol because it looked like a V for no other reason than that. All right, so volatility changes uh based on increasing or decreasing it and with its corresponding uh number here so we're looking at vega now in this column you can see vega over here is in this column as well uh one thing to note this is also the number we're going to be uh really keying on right now so we talk uh about volatility affects the premium for every one percentage point move. So we're talking one percentage point moves, one increment on all of these, right? So if the underlying volatility increased by one percentage point here, all right? So basically we are moving up to 1733, one positive increment higher. You can see volatility is always positive on both the calls and the puts because as volatility increases, our premiums are gonna increase. As volatility decreases, you know, goes down, you got that negative plus a positive makes it a negative to our premium. So right now we're talking about a positive move, $1 increase. We're looking at going from 241, all else being equal, the underlying doesn't change at all. We're at 265 on the bid, increases by, uh, so 274, right? So we increase by one percentage point. We can assume our premiums will increase by that much. Um, and vice versa, the same goes for on the calls. We're looking at these 168s, goes up by one percentage point. We get 21 cents coming in here. We're looking at 366, right? And then on the offer, we're looking at 376, right? So one percentage point increase, those premiums increase. Well, what happens when we get a negative? It goes down. And now we're talking about it goes down by one percentage point. We're looking at 1533, all right? Well, a negative move plus a positive makes it a negative to the premium. So then you would make those negative if it went down and it would decrease our premiums in that case. So we'd be looking at 223, right? And then 231, uh, 232, right? Pretty simple. So, I mean, yes, it's, it's not super simple, but does this... Does this start making everything start to click? You guys uh, seeing how this really isn't as difficult as 
A lot of people will uh, explain it otherwise. We go down, we have a negative move plus a positive. Positive moves are uh, what, what you see is what you get kind of thing. Um, so volatility affects our premiums that way. Now, something to note with volatility. We talked about theta is really aggressive the closer to expiration, it gets, it starts really ramping up. As a matter of fact, if you had like a theta curve, it would kind of look like this and then boom, not a dip there. Uh, but it starts really ramping up at around, you know, 35 days to expiration is really where theta starts picking up. Um, this is probably going to be a better line. I, I can't draw a good line, let me try it. There we go, kind of like that. It's more flat at the end, uh, but um, theta doesn't affect the further durations as much. Now, volatility though, affects the further duration options more. So start putting this together. Remember what I was saying, you know, people uh, buy options in these near duration expirations. Well, if I told you, Theta is much less back there. And if you want to retain some of that value, if nothing happens, you want to go a little bit further out in time, right? You're buying. Well, if volatility affects the nearer duration or volatility affects the further duration options more, then that helps you, right? So if you're buying options, you want to limit theta decay. You also want to limit how much you pay for those options. So if you're buying options, option premiums, if you're buying calls, buying puts, or buying whatever, an iron condor, I don't care what it is, you want to limit theta decay and you want to take advantage of volatility because volatility affects the premiums, right? And if volatility goes up, those premiums go up. They get inflated. So the idea is we're trying to set ourselves up for success here. And by doing that, we need to make sure when we're drilling down on these option components that we're setting ourselves up for success. You know, if volatility only increased, all right, and I bought it at a low level and that volatility just increased, I could see myself becoming profitable despite the fact that I'm directionally wrong or it's just not going anywhere, all right? It allows you to keep your powder dry. You're staying mechanical because you set the strategy up correctly, all right? So further duration options, get affected by premium or get affected by volatility more. And I got to say, usually we are in a, a strange time right now where we are seeing volatility uh, jump all over the place in different durations. But I'm talking generally speaking over the history of options, more times than not volatility, many more times than not volatility affects the further duration options more than the nearer duration. All right, everybody's still with me? Doesn't look like I've had anybody just leave the webinar, so that's a good thing. All right, so like I said, now we've got the key kind of broken down. We wanna start taking a look at uh, where are we going? You know, do we, have, do we have a destination? Well, first thing you do when you're basically gonna go on a road trip, you, you pick a destination. I mean, some people just start driving or, or do the whole Forrest Gump thing and just start running, but most people have a pretty good idea as their destination, but how they're gonna get there is still kind of up in the air. So we're gonna be looking at um, taking a road trip and we have to know literally uh, where we are thinking we are gonna go. So what I'm getting at here is uh, what underlying are we looking at, right? So however you come up with it, you know, let's just say uh, you're looking at a, at a chart or something. So we pull over a chart and Exxon Mobil uh, looking pretty bearish. I mean, if everybody's going electric. I don't know if I'd want to get bullish there. But, you know, in this certain time, like what kind of stocks are doing very well? Well, tech's really had that big run. Um, I'm kind of looking for stocks that I think will do well if something something changes or they're the ones changing the paradigm. So uh, let's just take a look at um, Pfizer, 
for a stock. You know, got Pfizer makes drugs, right? For hopefully a vaccine or something like that. Johnson and Johnson actually just went into a trial with something um, and believe that they might have something on the docket. So, you know, that's kind of where my head is. I, I don't have any right now um, exposure to the healthcare or the uh, these types of stocks. So that's kind of what I'm thinking. I wanna, I wanna get some exposure to that too, right? So now I'm going through the charts. I've looked at my portfolio. I've, I've got a hole in my portfolio over here with the uh, people that are trying to find a vaccine or a drug that will uh, help us through this whole problem. So um, in that case, I'm just going to say uh, with Pfizer, let's just go back to Pfizer. Um, I, I actually have a position in Pfizer. Forgot about that. Um, so, but anyway, we got a hole in it. I like Pfizer clearly. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to build a bullish assumption. I got a bullish assumption here. Yeah, they've had a big one. They might have a pullback down to the point of control. I don't know. Whatever, however you do your chart analysis, I'm just coming up with a bullish assumption here. So uh, what I'm talking about is let's just say, you know, this is Pfizer, PFE. So we're going to go to Pfizer and, you know, we live down here. So we basically are what? Looking at a bullish assumption, right? We, we need a, we need to head that way, which is a bullish assumption is really what I'm getting at. So basically with Pfizer, uh, you know, we're starting out here. This is me and we are going to PFE. All right. So basically, we need to start mapping out our, our line in the sand where we're going to kind of drive to get there, right? So that's the next uh, step in the process. So we've kind of got our route mapped out. We know what our destination is. We know we got to go north to get there, which is a bullish assumption. And uh, next thing we need to do is figure out what is that environment around our road trip? And what I mean by that is, you know, is it sunny? Is it clear uh, skies? We've got, you know, plenty of visibility. Well, think about that. When you're driving and it's a beautiful day, are you concerned about like what's going on outside the car? Your windshield wipers, are they moving fast enough? Uh, no, it's, it's pretty low stress, low volatility, all right? Well, what we're gonna have to do is look at our underlying, uh, does it have low volatility or high volatility? Because that's going to determine you know, if it's high volatility, it's stress. We want a beeline there, right? We talked about that. If it's high volatility, you know, we want to kind of get there fast, get out of the rain. Don't worry about it. If it is low volatility, though, um, we can we can take our time. We can uh, stretch out this road trip a little bit longer while we're going on the road there. So low volatility, I want you to think about it as low uh, low stress because volatility really is a, a, a stress indicator on the markets. As people are fearful, you know, they drive up premiums because they're going in and they're buying options without even thinking about how much value they're worth or anything like that. They're just like, I've got to have it. So they pay uh, through the nose for it sometimes that are, um, you know, get a little too lofty uh, for that. And then when that volatility comes out, it comes out really fast. But what we're gonna do is just take a look at our uh, option montage. We do, I don't know what Pfizer is right now. So uh, let's take a look at implied volatility. You can see it's relatively low. Yeah, you could, this uh, right now back here, we're gonna have to kind of start discounting some of that because we're continuing to see this volatility elevated and it probably is going to be with us for the remainder of 2020. So I'm going to kind of start discounting what's happened before. And what we need to do is look at the chart here and say, you know what? This volatility is pretty darn low compared to where it's been uh, during this whole pandemic. So another thing we can look at for um, determining the volatility here is we come up with a uh, 
and and if we're going to discount this, what's going on before, we kind of need to know what this uh, formula is right now. So basically, you're looking at the high, three points of interest on the implied volatility chart here. The high, which is, we're going to call it 87, just round it up. Uh, the low is 15, and the current is, uh, we'll call it 31. So I'm going to probably need my calculator here, so I'm just going to get it prepared. So um, I'm going to leave it over here so I can use it. Because once I do this, I get locked out of doing a whole lot of it. All right, so when we're looking at where implied volatility is in relation to where it's been in the past, and we're going to kind of discount what's happened before this whole uh, pandemic because we might be in a completely new paradigm. It seems like it's holding on. So we need to find out where 31 is in relation to where it's been in the past. So we have three points that we just talked about. We've got the uh, 87 here. We've got 87 and I think I said that the low was 15 and the current is 31. So we take where the current IV is, current IV, implied volatility, all right? minus the uh, low IV, all right? We take that sum and divide it by the high IV minus the low IV. So what this, uh, that sum anyway. So what this does is, you know, it tells us where the two highs and lows are and it tells us where this is in relation to that. So we basically go uh, the current IV, sorry, uh, 30, 31 minus the low, 31 minus the low, which was 15. We take that sum and we divide it by the high, which was uh, 87 minus 15. So basically we're looking at 16 divided by uh, 73, sorry, 72, right? So, 72 goes into 16. I'm going to do it in my calculator. 70, uh, 22 percentile. So 22 percent. All right. So my rule for this one is you can get away with it in the middle of the road, but really what we're looking for for volatility is I want it to be this number right here. I want it to be less than uh, 50, less than or equal to 50 percent. All right. Lower, generally speaking, is better, to be honest, because what I want to do is uh, if my volatility is really low, you know, I know that those back months, I'm not paying that much for those option strikes, right? And that's ultimately, since with this strategy, it is going to be a debit spread. And yeah, I'm taking it off the shelf and thinking about it for a second. But uh, I, I want you guys to also get those levers and pulleys going, you know, with this poor man's covered call, uh, part of it is leaps, all right? So I don't usually use leaps, but that's, if you go online, they're gonna talk about leaps. All right, so uh, my implied volatility percent is pretty low for Pfizer, 22%. <clears throat> I actually, it's lower than that because now that I think about it, I went and took the very low, which was 15. That's from before this whole pandemic. If I put it up 10 percentage points higher, uh, we would probably be in the 10th percentile, right? If I made my low 25 instead of 15, my IV percent will go much lower. All right. So um, I know I have low implied volatility percent. That means you know, uh, I can take my time to get there, right? Because we talked about this. If I have low volatility, uh, I want to be able to take advantage of that volatility. Um, I can take my time to get there. Another thing might be, hey, I want to track this thing like it's a stock. You know, this strategy um, also, if your assumption was a bullish assumption and you're like, hey, I want to take advantage of this like a stock, well, this is a great strategy for that too. Um, and we've already done the ones on the risk reversal and the uh, synthetic long. One of the beauties in this strategy versus the synthetic long 
is that we have limited risk to the downside, all right? And, uh, but with that, we're also uh, limiting our reward to the upside. So um, that's the benefit of this one versus the synthetic long. Another thing, you know, when we talked about the risk reversal over there, risk reversal, we were still talking about, we didn't know what volatility was gonna do, go up and down. And the risk reversal, if you guys were watching last week, we, you know, we wanted to isolate that volatility. We wanted to balance it or, uh, or neutralize volatility. So why would we use this one over those other ones? I, those are the reasons. We, we want to limit our risk to the downside, which you know would lead us to either this strategy maybe or the uh, the other one. All all encompassing. I want to track this underlying, right? So one of your main objectives is to track that underlying, which is going to lead us to like the synthetic long uh, uh, bullish risk reversal, or we have also the poor man's covered call. Those track the underlying. Uh, very similar to what how you would build out a regular strategy around a stock with those. So uh, we want to track also, but now we've got this low volatility. Uh, and how do we how do we play that? Well, we can't necessarily offset it. So we're leaning towards now, not the synthetic because I want limited risk. Uh, so that's out the window. Risk reversal has that limited risk, but we got really low volatility. So I want to set myself up for success and take advantage of the possibility that volatility will expand. If volatility expands, it will help me out in this situation. So we talked about it, we're down here and we're going to Pfizer. Well, if we can take our time, we can basically look at Route 66 and uh, take our time, follow the old road, hit some of those uh, um, roadside attractions, which uh, some of you newer people haven't heard this before. I'm gonna, I'm a sucker for a roadside attraction. <laughs> I pull over at all of them. You know, it's a great way to get out, stretch the legs, and uh, see Americana. All right. So why does volatility matter? Because when volatility expands, we can take advantage of it. And we don't want to get caught in a situation where we're paying too much for volatility. That implied volatility percent will tell us where those premiums are, right? We can see that Pfizer has relatively low premiums compared to where it has been in the past. So therefore, uh, because that implied volatility number, remember it was like 31, right? We were looking at 31 uh, just as implied volatility. And yes, it is a percent. Um, so that can be a little confusing, but you know, it was 0.31 over there on that chart. That doesn't, 0.31 doesn't tell you anything. It doesn't tell you if volatility is high or low. It's really low compared to, uh, to Tesla. Tesla probably never gets as low as 0.31, but it doesn't tell us what 0.31 means to Pfizer. So that's why it's important to know that, um, that uh, mathematical equation I showed you where current minus the low, divide that sum by the high, minus the low sum to come up where 0.31 is in relation to where it's been in the past. And we figured that 0.31 is low for Pfizer. That means premiums across the board are pretty cheap, okay? So if volatility is low, we buy premiums. Volatility is high, and volatility is high, which is that implied volatility percent, then we sell premium. Right now, we're looking at low volatility in Pfizer. That means I need to be looking at buying premium to at least take advantage of volatility expanding, right? Um, we know it's relatively low. It's probably not going to go much lower. Uh, and generally speaking, each underlying has a range bound area, relative range bound area. It's not completely perfect, but they have a tendency to see uh, uh, a sideways range bound area, okay? They usually find their lows around 15 for Pfizer or, or maybe the new paradigm is 25 and a high of, uh, a very high of 86. And I don't know if it'll ever get back up there, but at least now we know where our lines in the sand are 
to uh, keep this thing uh, relatively um, equal, at least. All right, so what's the duration? Well, I want to take my time on this trade and hit all those tourist stops. So obviously, if I want to hit all these along the road and track Route 66 to the T, uh, I, I want a longer duration time to take advantage of that. So I'm going to try and pick something that follows this underlying like uh, dollar for dollar or relatively along the way. So the spots we're going to hit are going to be, um, I don't know why I, I, I missed it. I uh, got rid of a, a strike. Um, so what sp spots are we going to hit? Well, we're going to be buying the longer duration. So days that I'll just go into this, we're going to kind of look at um, longer duration, days to expiration, okay, long days to expiration. So I'm going to be looking at something that is greater than 70 days to expiration uh, for my long, for my, uh, for my long calls, all right? And then, um, because I want to take advantage of, I want to take advantage of volatility expanding if it happens, and I want to th limit that theta decay, okay? So, uh, but I want it to follow this underlying closer to what uh, the underlying is doing. So when we talked about delta and all of that stuff, what did I say at the very beginning of that delta? You know, for every dollar move higher, the underlying moves what? That position moves up by a dollar. Well, if we want to track this very close to what the underlying is doing, then we want to go deeper in the money on these option contracts um, in order to take advantage of that, that same dollar for dollar move. So what I'm looking at for that long call is about an 84 delta, okay, for that long call. And this means that if I'm buying that 84 delta, I have no risk below here, all right? The underlying goes below my strike, my long call strike, I have no more risk. So that's our limited risk to the downside, whereas like the synthetic, we aren't uh, being able to take advantage of that. So if I want this to kind of dollar for dollar work with this underlying, then we are looking at like something in the money. And usually when I'm looking at in the money options, I'm looking at around that 84 delta, okay? So, and the reason why is that's a one standard deviation move, you guys. So, uh, a pretty low likelihood event. I got an 84% probability of being in the money at expiration. That's another thing Delta tells you is the probability of being in the money. Delta is data. All right, so we're done with that. Theta is our thief in the night. We talked about this thief. It comes in and eats away at our premiums. And this is the chart I was trying to draw for you guys early and uh, really butchered it. But you can see here, 35 days to expiration, this really starts getting steep, all right? And uh, if you were to do this as a triangle, you can see that it starts steepening there. Whereas out here where I was talking about 30 plus days to expiration, it's relatively flat. So you can see the closer to expiration, it really starts uh, eating away at those premiums and inside of seven days, which is, something I usually stay away from. Yes, you do get a lot of theta decay, but I'm looking at trying to get in and out of these trades and uh, that closer to expiration, you also have uh, gamma, gamma affects delta a lot more closer to duration. So that gamma component can really offset easily every you know 50 cent move, dollar move in the underlying is really going to uh, the gammas probably going to offset that data uh, quite dramatically. All right, so what vehicle do we use? We are looking at the poor man's covered call because I want to limit my risk to the downside. I've got low volatility that I, I can take advantage of that expansion of volatility. I want to limit my risk so I'm not, I'm not doing a synthetic because that is dollar for dollar the risk reward of the underlying. I want to maybe have a synthetic put in my strategy. So uh, the synthetic put is basically anything below that 84 delta, uh, market goes any 
where below where that 84 delta strike is, I have no more risk, right? Because that's the one I'm buying an option. Remember, when you're buying an option, you have the uh, the right, but not the obligation to have somebody fulfill that contract, all right? So therefore, if the underlying goes below our long call, we can just be like, I don't, I don't want to buy it way up there now, right? Uh, I'm out of this trade. It's a th synthetic stock. You're you're done with it. So how do we build the poor man's covered call? We buy that in the money leap. Now that's how you're. You know I've got to really you know show what um, conventional uh, thinking is out there or what the masses are thinking because I want you guys to be able to relate this to what I'm doing. You know most people are going to say the leaps. That's long term anticipated uh, securities, right? So what we're looking at though, I, I'd like to stick around that 70 uh, plus days to expiration. I like a little bit shorter duration. Now, if you are wanting to be in this strategy, you know, for a long time, I wanna add this to my portfolio and I'm thinking, uh, you know, I don't wanna put up a lot of capital because I'm, I'm margin deficient in my portfolio or you have a smaller portfolio and you wanna build out a um, you you want to build out a more balanced portfolio, then by all means, go out to those leaps. Uh, if you are doing that, you're going to need to be very diligent about selling out of the money calls against that strategy. That means rolling those out in time over and over and again. You're going to want to find that 35 days to expiration uh, option right here, which that's what these are. That's what the spot month is. is is about the ones that are closest 35 days to expiration. We used to call that the spot month. That's where the most eyeballs are. So you're gonna to need to be very diligent about doing that. Why? Because this in the money option that I talked about, this 84 Delta has intrinsic value and extrinsic value. So intrinsic value is what that 84 Delta option is worth, what that strike is worth. And, um, extrinsic value is theta decay. Well, if I'm buying it, you know, I, I talked about this a lot, we want to limit that theta decay. Well, this this call that we're selling, it's really what is paying down that extrinsic value. And if you do it enough, you can actually do it enough and do it well, you can actually start paying off the intrinsic value of that underlying, right? So you can you can do that. So with this though, what we're looking at, how you build this out, we're going to start out with that 84 delta uh, put, and I wrote this is a 36 delta put, not the 16. Uh, you can make it a little bit wider and go out to that 16 delta, but we want to pay off the extrinsic extrinsic value of this underlying. So uh, a couple of different things going on there. This. Usually uh, out of the money call at the 36 Delta will pay off all of that extrinsic value. And we'll, we'll go through that here in just a moment. Just bear with me. All right, poor man's covered call. It's reduced risk uh, over just the outright stock. It acts like the outright stock with a long put and a covered call or what we used to call a collar on the floor. So um, you're basically creating a uh, risk parameter equal to what the poor man's covered put is if you bought the stock and then threw a collar on it, uh, which is a long put and a short call. And I've, I've talked about how to do that with option strategies as well. We'll talk about that further down the road in this um, course. All right, reduce capital requirements anytime you're doing options basically and building out a synthetic strategy equal to what that underlying is, you're gonna have reduced capital requirements which enables you to have a more diverse portfolio and you have a higher probability of success rather than just doing the outright stock, right? Return on capital is going to be better, but we are not going to receive a dividend, all right? You're gonna to have to stay active in option cycles. Well, is that a disadvantage over owning a lot, uh, a stock? No, actually, so that's really not a major disadvantage. Uh, one though is that we do have an expiration that we have to worry about. Forced assignment comes in with those short calls, that blows through the upside, you stay in this trade. Um, 
you you are going to have to worry about those short calls getting uh, a forced assignment on that. Keep in mind, we've got that long duration call though, and we can just stick it to the other guy also and offset the entire trade. But it's just a pain when that happens is really what it comes down to. You're not losing any more money from doing that. It's just it's just a headache to be honest. So I usually cover this trade if I if it starts breaching those short calls. I'm basically seeing a profit on this. It's reached my target. I'm looking to get out of that. So real quick review. We've got a directional assumption that is bullish. I've got a bullish assumption in this. The destination is uh, I'm looking at Pfizer, PFE. I've got that destination. Oh, one thing I wanted to talk about with the destination though is um, we need to know if this underlying has good markets. That's really our destination. Does our destination have a lot of things for us to do? Do you want to go to a one horse town where there's a blinking yellow light uh, and nobody ever comes through that town? There's nothing to do. You know, you got um, maybe one bowling alley that you can go to all day long, every day for a week. No, we want a lot of things going on. We want to be able to go to the uh, go to the beach. We want to go to a couple of different restaurants. You know, I want to, I want things to do. So picking the right underlying, picking the right destination. What we're looking at here is my rule of thumb for this is going to be that if, uh, the underlying is less than a hundred dollars. So we have an underlying that's less than a hundred dollars, which Pfizer is, then I need my option montage to show the bid to offer equal to or less than 10 cents wide. So what that means is it's under a hundred dollars. I want to look over here at the options that are, you know, the spot month, which is closest to 35 days. And that's going to be this August one. That's for just this rule. We want to make sure they're equal to or less than 10 cents wide to the bid offer. And you can see that that fits that rule. All right. Yes, further out here, they're going to get a little bit wider. Yes, the ones that are deeper in the money are a little bit wider, but we're looking at where all the, we want to see where all the eyeballs are. And that's really the ones that are uh, closest to uh, at the money, all right, to fit that rule. And you can see that this one does fit that rule even after the close. Remember, after the close, uh, markets get a little wider. We want to look at this rule during open market operations. Now, if we are going to be looking at something that is over $100, and I think I've got, uh, I don't want that. Sorry. I want to look at this one. I think this is over $100. So, because uh, this is something I was looking at also, you can obviously see I've already got it. But uh, over $100 stock. So, if it's greater than $100 stock, I want to move my decimal three ticks to the left. So, we're looking at about 14 and a half cents, 14 to 15 cents. So, it needs to be less than or equal to 14 or 15 cents here. And if we take a look down here at these options, just uh, right in and around there, you can see that that pretty much fits the rule across the board. So uh, we could look at Johnson and Johnson for trading options, all right? So our destination is good in both of these two that we want to get exposure to the uh, drug market, all right? During open market operations there. Um, then uh, something I wanted to mention here with the... Um, building this strategy out. We've got a couple of rules here also. We, you know, perfect uh, scenario uh, when we were talking about for a couple of things here. Um, here, I'll, I'll just go over here. I'm gonna do it on here. So uh, let's pull this up. You know, we've got the uh, stoplight mentality, right? So I'm gonna say we've got a couple of stoplights here, right? All right, a couple of stoplights for these, you know, fitting this rule. And I talked about the destination, you know, if it is going to be uh, less than or equal to 10 cents wide, or, you know, the rule where we move the decimal three ticks to the left, right? That's a green light if it fits that rule. Now, if it is two times that rule, right, then, we are looking at a yellow light, and that is for the destination. 
right? And if it's three times the rule, then we're looking at a red light. The idea here is you get too many red light or yellow lights, then you got to kind of really proceed with caution. Get too many red lights, you need to stop and reevaluate. Green lights, we're good to go. All right. Now the environment, the environment also is going to be something where we need to look at for that underlying. You know, if it fits my rule, it's less than 50 cent or, you know, the environment rule would be uh, for this one, if it is uh, less than, you know, 25 IV percent, IV percent is less than 25, that's green light. You know, if it's, you know, between 50 and 25, I didn't want a red light on that, I want a yellow light. You know, 50 to 25, basically, we're kind of looking at a yellow light and then, you know, greater than 50 is a uh, red light is what I wanted to have is a red light there for the environment. Now, the strikes, strikes here. What we're looking at is uh, if it is less than 75%, the width of the strikes, if our debit, our debit is, Seven, less than 75% the width of the strikes, that's the green light, all right? If it is basically 85 to 75% the width of the strikes, that is a yellow light. And a red light is basically, our, our debit is greater than 85% the width of the strikes, we're walking away. Um, Something else with the environment we need to know uh, is we don't want a big we don't want a big discrepancy between uh, our implied volatilities of this particular underlying. So we need to be aware of that as well. So part of our environment that we need to look at is going to be um, looking at this here. Uh, the difference between our volatility coefficients. So um, right here, we don't want a big difference here between these two. So you can also think about it if it's um, less than, we'll say less than 2% here difference, like it increases less than 2%, that's a green light. If it's basically between, um, you know, uh, two and, 5%, it's between two and 5%. Actually, that's way too high, I'd say two and 4% really. It's kind of a yellow light. And if it's, um, you know, and that can be, a, the reason why I lowered it, it's, if it's got the four handle, 4.13 or something like that. And basically greater than 5%, uh, just walk away from it. So if this increase is greater than 5%, so you're looking at 22 and this was, 27, sorry, 27, uh, then that would start being too much. Why? Because we're buying this one out here, right? We said we're buying out here and we're selling in here. That means you're paying a lot for these premiums uh, versus what you're selling it for. So we're trying to, you know, set ourselves up for success here and we want to avoid that pitfall. So make sure that the difference in the two contracts we're trading uh, don't have a massive difference, all right? So Johnson and Johnson would kind of fall inside of that yellow area. But if all, everything else is working out, then and we don't get any red lights, you know, we just know we got to proceed with caution. We need to make sure we uh, are, are ahead of the ball there. All right, max profit, width of the spreads minus the debit pay, right? Uh, so that's our max profit. And the reason why we want to make sure we're paying less this debit is less than 75% the width of the spread. We want our risk reward to be worth it as well. So part of that whole thing is coming up with whether or not my risk reward is in line with what I need it to be, right? So it's less than 75% the width of the spread um, makes, makes us see that, you know, we're risking less and able to make more. If our, it uh, gets up 85% debit, right? That means, uh, our risk reward is, is getting a little bit twisted. So we wanna 
find something else rather than the poor man's covered call really is what that breaks down to. And keep in mind, because we got different expiration cycles, we are having, you know, our match, all of these things are just basic guidelines. They're not like lines in the sand, all right? So our max profit is considered unlimited because that short near duration call could expire worthless. And then we have that upside in the back end that we can take advantage of. Our max loss though is our debit paid. We already talked about this. It goes below where our strike is. We know that we have limited risk to that downside, all right? Our break even is the long call strike plus the debit paid. This, like our synthetic long, we want to build this strategy so we're not paying well above where the underlying is currently trading. That means there's too much extrinsic value in those calls that we're buying. So that's another reason why I'm talking about trying to build this out with a little bit shorter duration, selling some calls against it. Therefore, if you're building this out correctly, you guys, the uh, break even should be right there at around where the underlying is trading. So that's another fail stop that you can implement into this is if you're looking at all of these things um, that, that we're looking to get out. All right, so we're taking Pfizer, right? The PFE, all right, to, uh, we haven't determined this actually, but our winner is gonna be when we hit that short call, right? We break above our short call and our loss is going to be uh, it, it's hard for me to say what your loss is because my risk parameter is a little different than yours. But if it breaks, you know, however you would say where your stop is, all right? So your loss is where your stop normally would be, all right? So if it broke, you know, $5 lower and you're saying, okay, it breaks below, you know, this candle that goes right here, that's where I'm out. Well, that's the same thing with this one. You're getting out where uh, it breaches uh, your chart setup, all right? So let's just go through the example real quick and uh, take a look at uh, what is it, Pfizer is what I was looking at. Now, going through the steps real quick, right? Pfizer is a $38 stock. I look at the bid offer right here. Is it less than uh, 10 cents wide to the bid offer? Yes, even after, after the market closes. The next thing we were looking at is the environment. We already determined we've got pretty low implied volatility. Let's just say we went through the chart process. All right, 39 or 35 in relation to this, we found out that our implied volatility percent is low. All right, so that's, that's good for this. Another thing that we talked about here, and this is a little bit different. Anybody notice this Vega over here, right? I, my rule for this is the green light was that it was less than basically 3% difference. Volatility usually affects the further duration options more than the near duration. But here we can see volatility is less than it is in the front month. How does that make this strategy work? Poor man's covered put is perfect for this kind of situation, or poor man's covered call is perfect for this kind of situation. I am paying less out there on the time horizon in volatility, which means I've got super cheap premiums. And these ones that are near duration that I'm selling actually have a little bit more volatility pumped into them. So I'm getting paid for saying, selling these front months and uh, I'm paying a little bit less in those options back there that are expected to increase uh, if volatility increases. So in that case, uh, we're looking at that 84 delta. So I'm gonna basically be looking at the 85 delta here. Actually, I'm gonna go to the 82s, uh, decrease my risk a little bit more uh, to the downside, right? So I the rule of thumb on the 84 delta, you're now almost ever gonna find that 84 delta, but you know, that's a starting point is really what it is. Here's the little floor trader hat for you real quick. We're looking over at the corresponding puts. That tells us what the extrinsic value is ballpark, all right? Like, I don't really wanna go and figure out the exact number of what extrinsic value is. 
You want to go through the map? Basically, it's track this from that, and blah, 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 blah. No, just look at the corresponding puts or the corresponding out of the money option. If you're looking at in the money puts, you know, then you would look at the corresponding call. But in this case, we're looking at calls. Just flip over there. All right, it's somewhere around 30, 40 cents. So I want to go to the near uh, duration options and look for that corresponding call. Well, I said you were going to be looking at the 36 ish delta, right? Well, look at this. I'm I'm kind of looking at that extrinsic value, saying it's it's right there, 41, right? So um, I know that I probably paid off the extrinsic value, so I'm getting this uh, option for its value. Right, so it'd be like buying the underlying with a put in a sense. I don't have any risk below here, so uh, we can break it down. Something else I want to look at is uh, find my uh, calculator here. Let's zero it up. Is it less than seventy-five percent the width of the stripes, or somewhere at least the yellow light? We're going to have to find out. So five dollars and seventy-seven cents is my debit. Minus the width of the spread, which is seven eight eight dollars, right? Seventy two. So that's below that seventy five. That's a green light here, right? So that's another green light for this strategy. I'm paying less than seventy five percent the uh, strike there. We can also figure out where the break even is. Are am I did I get rid of all that extrinsic value? Well, it's the long call plus the the long call strike plus the debit paid. I'm looking at basically 38.77. So I've got a little bit of, you know, last trade, you know, the market is still open, uh, but 38.77 is pretty in line with where, you know, this market was at the close. So I'm right there in line with it, you know? So that's a green light. I'm not paying up too much for it. So I basically got this underlying work for where value is. Now, for me, I would be looking at something like, you know, if it broke below, let's say, you know, I, I don't know how you're, you would look at yours, but you could say, all right, if it breaks below there, I'm out of that trade, right? You could throw up the Fibonacci's and have it, you know, if it breaks below a Fibonacci or, you know, if it breaks, if you look at a point of control, it breaks below this area right here, I'm out. Write all that stuff down, throw it in your, um, your notebook or in your notes for your trading platform because it'll help you stay mechanical, you guys. Last thing you want to do is let your brain talk you out of what your uh, original setup was, right? And for me, basically, if it goes up there and hits $41, $41, that's where I'm getting out of this trade, okay? Uh, $41 would be the 52-week high, okay? So that's a place that I'm going to be looking to get out of this trade, all right? So I've limited my risk to the downside. I know I have no risk below, uh, what was it, 33. Um, so I know that if, you know, Pfizer goes bankrupt tomorrow, I have no risk free low throughout 33. But, you know, keep in mind, you might say, if it breaks below here, I'm gonna cover this trade for a loss but I'm gonna get out of it there, all right? So make sure you do that. Follow that strategy uh, and um, stay mechanical with that. So in that, you know, I said, you know, 37. So you could say, all right, for a loss, it trades below 37, I'm out. Write it down, okay? I'm out if I get it below 37 and write it down. For 41 is my winner. I go up, Pfizer goes up to 41, that I'm getting, I'm cashing out of this trade, okay? But write those things down because once you get involved in this strategy, you guys, and it starts maybe going against you and it goes down to 37 and if you, it's only in your head, you're gonna have a tendency to bend those rules and I don't want you to bend the rules on this. I want you to stay mechanical. If we stay mechanical and say we're out here, we're out here, we take the emotion out of trading, which is, Emotion in trading is detrimental and money is uh, an emotional um, 
thing. So we want to stay away from that. All right. JQ in the house. Uh, uh, hi, Wolfman. All's well here. Hope all's well with you. Just stopped in to say hi. Thanks, JQ. Well, I hope you learned something from this. I know JQ is a uh, savvy trader. He's he's one of my longtime students that are, are students of trading. I'm probably he's probably not considered just my student, and I don't know if he would consider himself a student of mine, but he's part of the family and and definitely is in a lot of these webinars. So I'm sure he's learning some of this stuff too. Um, so uh, make sure you write these things down. Build it out. Lawrence, hi, how are you doing? Uh, thanks for the shout out. So write these things down. It'll help you keep mechanical and stay with a process, right? If you stay mechanical and do the same things over and over and over again, then you will see the probabilities work out in your favor. If you are, if you're just all over the place and sometimes you're mechanical and sometimes you're not, then you're not going to have solid data to go on. All right, so that's why we're trying to stick with that. So make sure you're staying with that. And uh, there's no more, no more uh, questions other than compliments and saying hello, which I appreciate JQ and Lawrence and everybody else that's blowing me up over there. Um, that's how we stay mechanical. So follow those rules step by step to implement this. Now I might implement this tomorrow. I'm gonna. Um, probably look at Johnson and Johnson. Johnson and Johnson had a few more red lights than what Pfizer had. So yes, I did cherry pick Pfizer for a perfect example of this, but uh, I might look to implement Johnson and Johnson um, tomorrow. So uh, keep your eye out on Twitter or watch the daily market commentary for that. All right. So without further ado, over in the chat window, I'm throwing this link in there. This is, uh, Wolfman's Options Lab, you know, first 100 people are going to have instant access to the lab course. I don't know if that's actually uh, full yet, but the first 100 members are chartered members of Wolf, Wolfman's Options Lab program. Uh, I, I forgot to check that before we jumped on here, but you get all kinds of stuff. You, you get premium upgrades to the VIP courses. You also get discount VIP promotions, Option Lab events. You also as important as everything else is, get unlimited access to me. If you wanna write me an email, uh, ask me about this trade that you've got on, I will immediately reach out to you. I have a no inbox policy. I answer everybody. If I can't answer you in an email, I'll pick up the phone and we'll work through it on the phone. So that link right here is over in the chat window. We've been going back and forth in the questions box. Uh, all of that, you get full access to basically everything. Pull up that link over there. Hit that chat window link so you can see everything that is in there. I have the link in there. I'm not going to pull up the web page and start scrolling through it uh, because it is uh, an endless scroll, it seems like. So if you learn anything at all from me today, you want to take advantage of having a mentor, then for $97 a month, that is a bargain basement. Uh, I will talk to you guys, work through anything. Uh, and really, if you need more help uh, where I'm not rushing through something, then we'll walk through it uh, at your pace. So take advantage of that for 97 bucks, like I said, bargain basement. If you're learning online, you know, if yes, you get that education for free, but they're also not going to break it down as to why we're using the right duration, how you can set, they're not gonna talk about that difference in volatility, I can assure you, as to not setting it up where the volatility has a major discrepancy. Nobody's gonna talk about that. That's something you're gonna learn here. Why? Because I've seen the pitfalls, I've actually traded through those pitfalls and know that that's something I don't wanna put myself through. Uh, but those guys online, listen, they're cherry picking stuff. They're they're not they're not living this like a real trader. That's what real traders uh, will tell you, and floor traders know. Um, anyway, so here's also the link. I just want to thank you guys all for participating. If you have any questions, comments, or ideas for future webinars, reach out to us at three one zero five nine eight six six seven seven, or you can email us at trading a pro trader strategy with that. But I do appreciate you guys all. 
Thank you very much for your kind comments over there in the questions box. Like I said, the links over there in the chat window um, and you get all kinds of stuff. Charter members uh, and unlimited access to me plus a lot more uh, daily market commentaries, all that good jazzy stuff. So please click, uh, click on that link, mull over that. If you're watching on tape delay, you're gonna have to pause and punch into the URL. All right, so without further ado, yes, we are an educational company. And like anything, there is inherent risks in trading. So please take a moment to go over this or wherever it is on the screen um, to uh, know what your risks are and that we are just trying to teach you guys. I would never give a trade recommendation. I don't know what your risk parameters are. I don't know what's in your portfolio. And to be quite honest, I think your assumption uh, on, on a directional move is probably just as good as mine or anybody else out there that is claiming that they know where the market's gonna go, all right? So that's all I got for you, other than if you can't take that, take it easy. JQ, do you see it on the screen? Do you have the screen up? Did you get that 3D move? JQ, JQ is always all over the take it easy part. But if you got the screen up, every time I say take that, Take it easy and throw in the card at it. This is one of the things we used to do on the floor is take a trading card and zing it at the zing it at the person. All right. I gotta roll. Bye for now, you guys. Take care. So now, now you guys got that image in your head. Whenever you hear me saying that, you know I'm reaching over here. I've got a card ready for you. If you can't take that, take it easy. <laughs> I'm deadly with those things. I can hit you from 30 feet away. All right. Bye for now.